Okay. Um, well, welcome. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> um, today, I guess, is our last meeting. Uh, we could meet again on Wednesday and uh, Friday, but I don't see that we uh, we need to. Um, You've come a long way, I think, in this class. We've covered a lot of uh, water, waterfront. Uh, the, so, excuse the pun, I suppose, in, in some respects, but uh, uh, a large landscape. Uh, and some of the things that we were doing 15 weeks ago that seem new, you just take for granted. You know that pressures vary linearly with depth. You have this triangle distribution. That's just all those things are second nature to you now. And so. So you have come a long way. Um, I'm always curious about the, the prosecution of this class and where it goes. Uh, SRTs are open now. Of course, you know how those work. We don't get to see it until after the uh, um, final grades are, are in, and it's absolutely anonymous. So I encourage you to, to go there and uh, to note your thoughts. Um, things I am interested about are ways that we present this class, uh, online, offline, um, the ways we do evaluations, the utility of the different things we do. Uh, it may seem that it's maybe clutched together illogically, but there's absolute logic applied in it, I think. Um, the homeworks are to make you uh, uh, absorb the material and think about it. I know that I'm pretty sure that there's a, a small percentage, I'm sure no one here, who, who gained that system. That's why they're worth 15% and not 50%. Um, the presentations have a purpose, to make you think about something unusual work in a team and be able to produce something that you can uh, um, make a point of making a hypothesis and addressing it and solving something to be able to uh, prove or disprove a hypothesis. And so that's something that I think is quite a nice attribute of this class as well. 75% of the grade, of course, you know is uh, on exams. And the, the reason for that is because it's, it guarantees, it's the only really way to guarantee that uh, the work that uh, we see is your own work. And so that's the, the rationale for that. And so, in that kind of framework, it'd be curious to get your uh, feedback on uh, on those different things. Um, for those of you, well, probably all of you are here the first day, um, uh, maybe not every day in between. But uh, we made the point as I'm, I'm not sure how to 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 make the uh, the first exam not a, a wake up call. And, and I, I don't know how to do that. I've, oh, I always ask that question. I never have found out exactly how to do that. Uh, it would be good in some respects if, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm projecting on you what I think, but I don't know that's true. I don't know whether there's trauma attached with the, the tests or not, uh, but it'd be easier if, uh, I think it'd be easier if you could um, project your grade from earlier on. Maybe that would remove some angst in this, but maybe it's good also to have some angst because it probably brings out the best in you as well. So I think there's lots of different rationales in thinking about how to do this. But uh, your thoughts on this for uh, SRT, since I'm happy to take uh, comments now, you, or for people to stop by and chat. Uh, it is pretty anonymous, actually, when you chat, because I don't know who you are if you don't announce yourself or leave your business card. Um, so, yeah, so it's interesting to get feedback. So I know there's not much feedback here, but uh, and that might not be the thing that's on your mind right now either. But, uh, but it'd be interesting to to, to know exactly what uh, things are good in the course, what things are bad. Um, you know, I think the way the course is going is that the, to me it doesn't seem that the the in class stuff is is extremely valuable. Given probably we have 15 to 30 people turn up, so that's 10 percent of the class. It's a 327 person class, uh, and so. That, that's okay. It used to annoy me, the fact that we were going that way. I used to take it the fact that no one wanted to listen to my pearls of wisdom. Uh, but, uh, and that was a oh, terrible shock. And, uh, but now that's online is kind of quite normal. And uh, so I, I imagine that the class will go uh, more that way instead of less that way. And so I'm kind of curious to hear uh, your comments uh, about that, if you want to broach them here. Probably not. Uh, so, so SRTs are open. They're open until probably exam week begins, I guess. They don't open up to us until sometime in January after all this is said and done. Uh, and so I think that's uh, an opportunity you have. The numerical scores are always interesting to look at what those are in terms of the different attributes. The comments are more interesting, I think, because you get some kind of flavor for what's going on. So, anyway. So, that's that. So, we've covered a lot of ground, and I guess maybe I'll leave that on the tape. <clears throat> so that people can, uh, uh, who aren't here, aren't as diligent as you guys uh, are, uh, can hear this uh, request as well for some kind of uh, uh, 
uh, useful feedback. Oh, by the way, yeah, I, I did run a class once where it was quote unquote flipped, and that was the worst experience for myself and the students I could imagine. It wasn't this class, but it was a, a class I teach in the uh, the spring, and it was supposed to be the students came prepared by watching the videos, etc., and uh, we would then skip through and work on the uh, uh, the assignments, but no one ever came prepared, and the assignments never. So it was just basically it was just doing the assignments for people, so they wouldn't have to do them themselves. So I was never very excited about flipping the classroom, but maybe that was just my own inadequacy in terms of being able to to do that. So anyway, so so um, the final. So the final's worth uh, thirty percent. Uh, you have one more homework due, right, on this Thursday, so don't forget that. Uh, there is no homework 14, um, although the questions, all but the last of the homework que homework 14 questions would be relevant. Uh, they are on open channel flows. I think the last one is uh, hydraulic jumps, which we <coughs> talked only sparingly about uh, last time. There are some notes online for review, which we'll go through today. Uh, uh, I'm going to label them review 2015, but I'm using the 2014 ones because it hasn't changed, but it'll be clear from what we talk about today where the emphasis might be. Uh, there'll be three questions as before. They'll be worth at least 330 out of 300, uh, as usual, maybe a bit more actually. Um, and three questions cover this waterfront from uh, pipe flow, 10 and 11, uh, external flows, 12, and open channel flows, really 13, right? Not 13, 14. Um, there's one question on pipe flow networks, pipe flow pipe networks. Uh, there is one question on external flows, and there's one question on open channel flows. Uh, so, so that's the premise for what we'll talk about today in terms of uh, these things. Um, I don't know what else. Yeah, that's it. So, so maybe let's uh, talk a little bit about this. I've never done this. So this is our new, this is our new uh, program we have done. So let's, I can draw some things out. And I, I made some notes to myself. So uh, in general, so I guess this is really, <laughs> why doesn't, so it doesn't work. I was going to, oh yes it does. So what I was going to write, this is 10 through 13. Basically. And this is being recorded and it will go online. Some of my famous recordings, 600 hits. So, Actually, we have the my biggest movie ever has 4,500 hits on it, which is 13.1 for some reason, uh, open channel flows. So I have no idea why that is, but it's, uh, it's clearly not people uh, in this class only. Um, it's been up a few years, I guess, but uh, so interesting. All right, so uh, we've made the point before that uh, I'm happy to give you every single equation that you need. You need, of course, to know how to, to use them, uh, but that's, uh, that's fine. So just a preamble. Ideal gas law. Uh, you need the, this last time as well. Newton's law of viscosity. <coughs> Um, so, you need only one of those, as it turns out. I shouldn't mumble, but yeah. All right, so most of our, every, actually everything that we've done, <clears throat> and I'm sure you realize this, in the latter half of this class, after perhaps week eight, when we talked about energy equation, it was really Bernoulli that had these extra terms attached to it. And you should know this off by heart by now. Um, I always write it this way, you might write it a different way. But you need to know the energy equation, which is written as Bernoulli, plus a couple of extra terms. Um, we have to be careful to write it upstream and downstream. And I probably don't have to define these terms. Elevation head, pressure head and velocity head. And the other two terms which represent the uh, major losses and the minor losses.
Whoops. Um, we know that the major losses are always defined as something like um, a friction factor and a couple of non-dimensional term, the length to the diameter of pipe ratio and the velocity v squared over 2g. I guess we have to be aware of the fact that this is always upstream. We know this. This is always downstream. Um, if we work with big tanks, then these are the typically the locations on the surfaces of those tanks, in which case we can throw the velocity away, P is atmospheric, and we're left with the elevation terms. For instance, if we have big tanks, this is the only term we're left with. Uh, the pump head is also in the same units as these. It's the amount of energy that gets put into the system to pump if it's positive or taken out if it's <coughs> negative, generated by a turbine. The magnitude of this is always equal to um, its a length by definition and its power, which is watts, divided by um, unit weight of water times volumetric flow rate. You can write this in a different way. You can write it as um, G times M dot, mass flow rate, uh, just because this is equal to uh, density times gravity, but it's the same, same expression. Uh, and uh, this minor losses, the sum of minor losses, are just uh, given as some coefficient. Well, don't need sum, do we? HL is individually equal to some, typically some coefficient, which we can get a number for, multiplied by V squared over 2G. And so important is that these are the velocities in the pipes, or the fittings, or the pipes around the fittings, and these are the velocities in the starting point where you write Bernoulli and the finishing point where you write Bernoulli. Different things. If these are nozzles, then upstream and downstream velocities are different, etc. So you have to just re remember that case. I guess the only other thing that, that we've talked about, and uh, we defined last time that you should do it as a mass, conservation of mass, is we also know that V1, <coughs> A1 equals V2, A2. So this is continuity. So this is Bernoulli, as we know. Bernoulli modified it as the energy equation. Without these points here, it's in viscid flow. It has no viscosity. So without pump head and without these two losses, well, I guess it could have pump head in it, but it, these are the loss terms due to viscosity. Uh, and without these, it's just regular Bernoulli's equation. With it, um, and of course, uh, with it, there's no reason to have pump head in there at all. Actually, that's not quite true, is it? Ignore that statement. Um, so these these represent the viscous losses. <clears throat> so that's what make it, make it the energy equation rather than Bernoulli's equation. This is continuity or conservation of mass, whatever you want to call it. Same thing. <clears throat> and the other way that we've written this in the last little while has been that we've also written this as you recall. E1 plus Z1 is equal to E2 plus Z2 plus HL, I guess, this, this term here. These are all lengths. And we can also write this as, I think, E1 is equal to E2 minus... I think that's the right sign anyway, S0 minus SF. And we've made the point that this is the same kind of behavior. I don't really want to get sidetracked from this, from what I told you about whether this would be on your test or not. If this is the energy grade line, then just by definition, uh, this is equal to HL here. This is equal to Z1 
minus z2 here. This is the water level, whatever it's doing. And so, I mean, this is just Bernoulli's equation, right? This is physically the fact that the energy grade line, instead of being horizontal, we lose energy, frictional losses within the system. Whether it's an open channel or within a pipe, it doesn't matter. And in open channel flows, the only thing that's driving flow is not going to be pressure. It's not this pressure term here. It's going to be the elevation of the beds. And I suppose we should round this out by saying that in this particular case, this energy term is equal to what? It's equal to the depth of flow plus, I think, uh, unit flow rate, flow rate per unit width times 2g depth squared. And I guess this here is the depth y1, etc. And this is depth y2. And so this is for perspective. We said some things last time about what will be and what won't be on a test. And we'll, you'll figure that out from what we do and don't cover. But this is just tying this all together in one perspective. Everything in this last four or five weeks of the class from 10 onwards, I guess it's four, <coughs> for eight onwards really, has been dealing with Bernoulli and the energy equation. And it happens to come in two different flavors. The one that we use for uh, internal and external flows and the one that we use for open channel flows. Identical. Uh, just terminology is, is slightly different. And so in each case we have losses which are implicit in this system and we think of these losses in terms of this unifying diagram. <coughs> I was thinking of the Saturday Night Live skit with George Bush impersonation on unification uh, skit, but anyway, we won't go through that. And we have this diagram which is split into two parts. It's Reynolds number, which can be, uh, what is Reynolds number? It's a velocity of flow. It's a characteristic length. It's, well, let's not do that. The characteristic length is either a hydraulic diameter, it's a density of the fluid, and it's the viscosity of the fluid. It's also the velocity of the fluid, the hydraulic radius, and the density over viscosity. I presume this all shows up on here, right? Is it dark enough? And depending on whether this is uh, pipe flow or external flows, this transition from laminar to turbulent <coughs> occurs here. And if it's open channel flow, then in terms of hydraulic radius, it's a different number because hydraulic radius is a different number, but these are f a factor of four different, right? So if we write out the hydraulic radius, hydraulic radius is equal to area over perimeter. And we've often drawn this little diagram here. This is my best three-dimensional diagram. This is the area. And the perimeter is this length here, per unit length. And hydraulic diameter, I think, is equal to four times area over perimeter. And so this gives you, <coughs> if you look at the cross-sectional area and perimeter of a circular section pipe, it gives you the diameter of that pipe. <coughs> So it's just a, a matter of terminology. So the fact that these are a factor of four different is reflected here. Okay? And so the terms that turn up in this for friction factor, that turn up, um, well, so this is either friction factor. It could also be coefficient of drag or lift. And it could also be Manning's coefficient. Those are the three <clears throat> frictional loss parameters that we deal with. Frictional loss because we have to provide more oomph in a pipe, pressure to push it through. Frictional loss because we have to have more gradient in a channel to let it flow down. Or frictional loss because if we have a higher coefficient of drag, we have a larger force 
that is exerted on a body for a given flow rate. Um, yeah, for a given flow rate. And so that we know that in this region, the behavior looks something like this. We know that for pipes, this is, some, well, some coefficient, some constant, divided by Reynolds number. And that in this region, you know, if it's a, a drag problem, then we have a little thing here that does this because of boundary layer effects. If it's a pipe, it's a whole bunch of parallel lines, which are a function of the relative roughness. And this is um, a large value of relative roughness. This is a small value of relative roughness. And the expression for a smooth pipe is one that comes down here. From the, on the Moody chart, anyway. <coughs> and so, I mean, I think I hope it's hopeful, helpful to be able to tie this all together. So all of these things, exactly the same behavior. We've talked about a drag co uh, friction coefficient for pipes. We've talked about drag coefficients around bodies, and we've talked about Manning coefficients in channels. They're really just ways of indexing in different ways the frictional losses of water going down a channel <coughs> and using up energy. The same as me pushing a bag across a table to get it back to its starting point, I have to provide extra energy because friction works is expended in both directions that I'm working against. Same thing. So uh, that's that. So these are the terms that go either into the pipe flow problem, and we've drawn this before, I think, right? We've drawn the, I've certainly drawn this before, the fact that if you're looking at flow down a pipe, then we're interested in the, the flow rate or the velocity that goes along here, and there's a shear force that acts here against that, which means that the, the pressure difference that we apply between upstream is expended in pushing fluid along there. If we take the same pipe and we close the end so that the flow is now around it like this, then again, we have from stagnation at each ends, we have a pressure drop across the system. And that's the, uh, would be manifest as what we call this squiggly D, the drag force that we have across the system. And if we have flow within a channel that's going downhill, which I maybe, I, I'm actually pretty good at drawing this one. Someone's sitting on a boat. Is that what's resisting flow here is there's a shear force on the wall. And it's providing a force that acts against the the downstream flow, and so we expend um, fluid through the system. And so this is um, Bernoulli, but well, they're all Bernoulli, right, I guess. But this is characterized by a coefficient of drag, which is equal to a squiggly D, the drag force, uh, divided by a half density the average velocity of flow squared and the, the characteristic area, cross-sectional area typically. So probably on this thing it would be a cross-sectional area would be here. This is a delta P by the way. And the flow velocity would be the far field flow velocity a long way away from the system because obviously the flow velocity here is zero and here is zero but the, the average flow velocity. And I guess in this particular case, uh, we have that the flow, average flow velocity is equal to this <coughs> coefficient, which is one if it's SI units, a Manning coefficient, um, a hydraulic radius, I think to the two over three, and a slope of the bed to the, is it a sixth or a half? Shows you how often I use. These. I guess it won't be on that one, will it? Uh, fine. But it is a half. Yeah, okay. This isn't bad. I don't mind this new software thing. Yeah, so this is a half. 
I thought it was a half. And of course, this bed slope is just this, right? This this length here is S0, and this here is L. No, sorry, that's not right. It's, uh, it's S0 if this is 1. So S0 is equal to Z1 minus Z2 divided by the length over which you measure it. And this is between point 0.1 and point 0.2. So, so if this is equal to 1, then this really is S0. But otherwise, uh, it's normalized. It's a non-dimensional number. Okay. And so that's, yeah, go ahead. S0 to the 1 half, yes. And we can check that. And I guess the other thing that comes out of this is that Q is equal to velocity times cross-sectional area, which is straightforward, right? We write those out separately as well. So that's kind of uh, trying to tie things together so it makes some logical logical sense. Certainly innate logic in fluid mechanics. That's why it's kind of a cool, I think it's a cool class to teach actually. Um, we didn't really finish talking about this, but the other thing is, I guess the important, the other important thing feature here is that in dealing with these, um, when solving these kinds of problems with this behavior, and we know this behavior is basically this chart which we haven't looked at, but you'll see it here. We've spent some time It's getting a bit finicky today. It's doing some moody chart. <clears throat> so you see all the things that we, we talked about. In the lambda regime, it's a function of uh, Reynolds number, which is important. In the turbulent regime, the fact that these lines are horizontal, both for pipe flow, but also for external flows, and also for Manning coefficients. Basically, for Manning coefficients, open channel flows, the assumption is that it's always turbulent. So you're always on the right-hand side of the diagram. So a constant value of a Manning's number, right? So this is either friction factor, or it's coefficient of drag, or it's a Manning coefficient. The fact that Manning coefficients for channels are a single number means that it's on the right-hand side. It's above this lamina to turbulent boundary and therefore you only use a single number for it. <coughs> the um, importance of noticing the difference between turbulent flow, sorry, laminar flow and turbulent flow is in solving some of this, these problems. And so that's probably something that's worthwhile noting as well. And it looks like Bernoulli's spelt with two O's there, but it's not. But, uh, anyway. And so you'll, you'll remember that when we talk about these behaviors, and it's probably worth while drawing it out again, is that when we talk, say, with the Moody chart, and this is Reynolds number versus, for example, coefficient of drag, that the behaviors we get, if this is for flow around a ball or something, it looks like this, this little dimple because of boundary layer behavior. Uh, this Reynolds number is always defined in terms of some characteristic length, whatever that is, <coughs> some length that makes a difference to the particular problem that we're dealing with, and that's usually defined for you. So you have to be careful that it's the appropriate length to use. It's not a length of pipe, typically. It's the diameter of the pipe, because that's the characteristic length that matters. And likewise, for external diameter external problems, it would probably be this diameter rather than the length of this pipe. Although you could imagine some cases in which it could be, you know, have a plate facing you, it would probably be the length of the plate rather than the thickness of the plate. So, but you'd be told, you're, you're always told that. All the coefficients of drag are a function of whatever the characteristic dimension are. Uh, what, what was I doing? So I was going to make the point that typically in problems where you're dealing with coefficients of drag, uh, what you're working on is a force bounce. 
a force that acts down on it, a force that acts upwards, could be a buoyant force, typically it's small, but probably could be there, depending on what you're dealing with. Um, in air, you probably don't have to worry about it. And the other force that's acting on it would be, in this particular case, if something is falling through the, through the atmosphere, then you have a drag force, curly D, this curly D here. And so it becomes a force balance that you have to solve for, say, a velocity. And these two regimes in that particular case make a difference. This is laminar, and this is turbulent. And so, if, for instance, you're looking at Stokes settling, and you're looking at the magnitude of this D force because you want to be able to balance it with these other forces, then rearranging the drag e expression is that D is equal to what? Coefficient of drag multiplied by a half density velocity squared times A area, some characteristic area. And I guess the, all, all the point I'm trying to make is, is that if you're on this side of the expression, then coefficient of drag is a function of, well, let me call it uppercase A divided by Reynolds number. This is some constant. Uh, no, let's not call it A for obvious reasons, right? Area. So I'll call it constant divided by Reynolds number. And so if we write that out, then we find out that D is going to be proportional to coefficient of drag. And coefficient of drag is proportional to 1 over Reynolds number <coughs> times velocity squared. But Reynolds number is proportional to 1 over velocity, is proportional to velocity. So this ends up being proportional to V squared over V times, yeah, times some other coefficients which is proportional to velocity. Always turns out that way. If you write it in the turbulent regime, then d again is proportional to this same expression, but now uh, cd is constant. A different constant, maybe. And so d is proportional to a constant that doesn't include velocity and v squared. And so the way that you solve these problems is slightly different because you solve it now in terms of v squared versus v. And so in this case, you have to take a square root of v to be able to get it. And so we'll look in a second, we're really ripping through time, uh, at a couple of examples, one in air where it's falling through the atmosphere, um, a hailstone being lofted up by air, you solve for velocity squared because it's constant uh, it's a turbulent regime, and the, the coefficient of drag is constant. If you're looking at Stokes settling, where you dump a bunch of sediment into a, a beaker full of water, you look at the rate at which it settles, and you come up with a, a grain size distribution based on the settling velocities, then it ends up being a function of this. Okay, we should probably move on. So, All right, so, so those are the important things that I, I wanted to talk about. So you have all the expressions. I'm pretty sure you have all the expressions in one place, more than you'd need for this test. Um, uh, we've already made comments about um, this. Um, so. so let's quickly go through this. Uh, pipe flow. Uh, it matters whether we're turbulent or laminar, because that defines what's going on. Uh, we've made that. Uh, make sure that if you're using Bernoulli's equation, these velocities that you use here are in the pipes themselves, not at the beginning or end of flows. That the diameter is the appropriate diameter for that pipe as well to be able to deal with it. If it's a non-circular section pipe, then this has to be hydraulic diameter, d sub h, which is equal to 4 area times perimeter. And think of these always as being uniform between these three different classes of problems we're dealing with. They really are the same. They're not, they're not different. And be aware of this kind of division between behaviors 
as you go across from here. Solving problems is a little different in this regime where it matters that the this is a function of velocity. Here it's much easier because it's not a function of velocity anymore and you can solve typically in one step. You don't need Colebrook. We know exactly what Bernoulli is. We've spent a little time talking about it. Uh, just to reiterate, these are the pressures uh, don't need this. This is one. These are pressures, velocities, and elevations uh, at the beginning of flow. These are the velocities within the pipe or within the fitting. This is always just a single number, and therefore it assumes really that it's always turbulent within the fitting. That's really implicit in that. Um, so that's that. If you're dealing with multiple pipes, then we know that the flow rates along the pipe have to be constant. Uh, and if you look at the pressure distribution as you go along the pipes, you would see that, I'm not going to draw it very well, it would change from this to this. These segments would have different pressure drops along them, according to this, which is really the fact that the sum of these head losses contribute in series. Uh, and therefore are cumulative, so they add to each other. Um, if you have parallel pipes, then the flow rates are additive, not the heads, and the head losses, by definition, if you write behavior between here and here, then you're only left with the head loss terms within the, the pipes themselves. So that's, that's something to, to look at. Look at this. This is useful also. Branched loop systems. Uh, we can't write very complicated ones. You'll never have to solve a cubic or a quadratic equation in a test. Um, and so there's only certain pipe loop systems that you can be asked to deal with. And you can figure those out. And in this case, again, uh, because the pressure at this point has to be the same as it goes in this trajectory or in this trajectory, then the head loss that occurs on the last section of these two pipes have to be the same as each other because they're both ending up at the same physical location. And so you can just write Bernoulli in two different ways uh, along two different routes, right? One route would be along here. One route would be along here. Actually, you did this in the last test. Question one in the last test was a problem a bit like this. Two separate pipes, though, in that case. And you can solve Bernoulli for the unknowns you have in the system. If you know what the unknowns are in the system, yeah, you can, you can get the flow rates through, through both pipes. We did this question, I think, in class. Um, I think it's probably a, a good thing to look at. Um, I think that, well, there is a pipe network question. Uh, on. So, so look at pipe networks. External flows. There is an external flow question. Um, you probably don't need to. These are for the nuances of behavior. So these mean that we can calculate what the theoretical drag force would be if we knew what the pressure distribution and the shear force distribution was around an object. Typically, we don't know that. So typically, what you have to do is you take a ball and you put it in a wind tunnel and you measure the force on that ball as you change the velocities. And that gives you this diagram that we've made the point before that we can get the diagram we talked about here, which is, you know, the, the boundary layer effect with this little bump in it. That's measured experimentally. It's not measured by a theoretical expression. And so this is a little esoteric, although I know you've done homework examples with this. But the two important expressions are these. They're identical to each other. Uh, we've said something about how to use them. The two type examples, I would say, of how to use them without going through this are these. One for the case where the flow is at low Reynolds number. So this is uh, laminar. And so you know that on this diagram, RE versus CD, that you're sitting here. And this, of course, is exactly the expression of this line here for a sphere. And from what we said before, we said that now the drag force is proportional to velocity on this side. On this side, the drag force is proportional to v squared, which just means you have to 
square root your final equation to get your results. So the type examples, I think, for these two problems, this is one for laminar flow. This is a second one for turbulent flow where you have to take a square root, but they're basically the same problem. You have a, a ball, you have some a force balance acting on it, and from that you can figure out what a velocity, uh, a terminal velocity would be. So understand the term terminal. A couple of years ago we did the Baumgartner example in class. This guy who went up to 100 kilometers above uh, 100,000. 100 kilometers now, 100,000 feet, and then parachuted, skydived out in a Red Bull jacket, and the uh, question was, what's terminal velocity? Same deal, it's just a force balance. Composite drag, same things. Instead of things moving, you apply a velocity to a structure. You calculate what the forces are on this structure from that velocity. If you have more than one structure, then you calculate individually what those forces are, assuming one structure flow pattern doesn't influence the other one and you come up with a, a number so but look at the balance expressions the first two we talked about open channel flows well we talked about uh, classifications of different flows we spent one period talking about uniform flows which are really probably the most important for you guys and gals uh, in dealing with systems flows in channels and we also talked a little bit about <coughs> gradually varying flows and the energy equation. But I think I said last uh, time there's not a question on that. So um, there is not something that deals with this. So that cuts a little bit of what you need to do. With. I don't think you necessarily need to understand this in great detail. You probably need to be able to use a Manning formula. And so, so it's again a recipe. A bit like Buckingham Pie, which is something you all did marvelously well on in the, uh, the second, uh, third test. Uh, so uh, Manning's equation allows you to get an average velocity of flow as a function of some coefficient, which for us, if it's in SI units, will always be 1. The units of this expression are not independent of dimensions. You can't do it in centimeters per second. It has to be in meters per second. So your hydraulic radius has to be in meters. This is a non-dimensional slope, so this doesn't matter what it is. It's you know, 1 over 100, 1 over 1,000, whatever the slope of your bed is. Uh, this is non-dimensional as well. So this has to be in units of length, meters in units of length. And if that is the case, this comes out as meters. If this is in meters squared, has to be in meters squared, then this is in meters cubed per second. So it's not non-dimensional, not independent of dimensions. Uh, we own, you've only ever had stuff from me uh, in SI units. And um, well, well, calculating values, it's just, a, as I say, it's a recipe. You want to be able to use this to calculate what either the velocity or the flow rate is. And so to do that, you need to be able to know something about what the Manning's coefficients are. The Manning's coefficients are always single numbers because they're always on this side, they're just these late straight lines, n equals 0 0.03, n equals 0 0.15, etc. The reason they are 0, 0.1. Yeah. 0, 0.1. I'm just making numbers up. The reason that these are single numbers is because they're on the wrong, isn't it? They're on the right-hand side of this behavior. Reynolds number is defined in terms of hydraulic radius. Importantly. And you can either average Manning numbers, Manning coefficients, which probably isn't the best way to do it. Or you can use compound uh, expressions to be able to figure out what the flow rate is, what the flow rate is in this channel, what the flow rate is in this channel, and the, what the flow rate is in this channel, so that you get the total flow rate in this case is just equal to the cross-sectional area times the hydraulic radius. 
The hydraulic radius, importantly, for this channel, the perimeter to use is this perimeter here, P1. Not this, right? Because that water in channel 1 is moving at exactly the same speed in channel 2, and therefore there's no relative drag between them. And so the, you're really using this as an index for the amount of drag. So do not include this in that number. The area of 2 is this area here, and the perimeter of 2, importantly, will be this perimeter. Uh, there are certain maximum most efficient sections which are defined by either a rectangular prism which is half depth times width, a 90 degree triangle, a hexagon which has 60 degree sides and is full up to the top or a half circle which is full up to the uh, radius uh, and you can go through that um, looking at these individual expressions so you can do the calculations so you need to know what the hydraulic radius is either individually or for the whole channel you need what the bed slope you need a Manning's number if you know what the Manning's number is this is because it's feet per second but if you know what the Manning's number is you know everything from those three to be able to calculate this. That's it. And so I could go on, but you'll be very happy to know that I don't need to go on. So, so that's it. So three questions, one from each of those topics. Understand the rationale of this. We've tried to paint it into a picture where it hopefully makes sense that the key diagram, I think, in terms of your own understanding, not in terms of the test, but your own understanding, I think, is this key di this diagram here. Everything fits together in terms of this. Everything that's important in this class fits into that diagram. Pipe flows driven by pressure gradient. Uh, external flows, we want the forces on objects. Open channel flows, we want the drag, and it's driven by gravity. But it really is the same expression for Bernoulli that we're using. Great.